the advance. This is advance. Okay. Well, I wanted to thank the organizing committee for uh, giving me the opportunity to present some of the work that me and a large number of colleagues have been working at at Emory and a number of other sites across the uh, across the country. So. Uh, a lot of the talks that have been here have been very uh, genomics focused and what our group is particularly interested in is sort of an imaging based view of cancer. So one of my colleagues, Dr. Cooper, presented some of his work with uh, glioblastomas and um, pathology data and um, what, we're, what we're actually focusing on in this talk is looking at some of the radiology data um, that is also available for a smaller set of the TCGA GBM cases but we're hoping to build that archive. Um, so. Like many of the other groups, we're looking at correlations of certain features with outcome and also with genetic profile. So what we're, again, we're specifically focused on this talk is radiology-derived features. So as many of you know, glioblastoma is um, a grade four astrocytoma and is the most common form of brain tumors with a very poor survival. And it was one of the first tumor types to be included in the TCGA um, pilot project. Um, so, as most of you know, mRNA data, copy number, DNA methylation data is available, but um, it's not as obvious on the portal, but there's also neuroimaging data on uh, this a cancer, cancer imaging archive as well as whole slide imaging, and so our group is mostly focusing on these two data types. So again, the general methodology empl employed in our in silico center is to develop uh, human and or machine-based assessments of imaging features. Um, so, in order to actually do this, uh, we, we have a large number of neuroradiologists that we've been working with, between six and nine, depending on the time of the year, that have actually been going through and actually annotating these cases for different features. Now, the question is, what are these features that they're actually marking up? And so, one of the things that there's a, I'm not going to go into detail, but there was a large amount of effort coming up with essentially a standard vocabulary to describe what these brain tumors look like. So, similar to the pathology data, what we're interested in is looking for extra signal that is embedded in the radiology data and the pathology data. Every case that we've looked at has a diagnosis of GBM, but when you actually look at the images, there's similar to everything else we've talked about, there's a huge amount of heterogeneity, and we want to kind of capture that information in a structured way. So particularly, um, Adam Flanders and Carl Jaffe came up with a standardized set, and they, there's lots of iterations of this, but basically it's all of the things you could think of that would describe the tumor, size, location, as well as different imaging properties. Um, now, if anyone's curious what VASARI stands for, it took me a while, I thought it was an acronym like everything else. It turns out the data set that we initially used to validate the, this feature set was called the Rembrandt data set. Apparently Rembrandt was um, biog the biographer of Rembrandt's name was Vasari, so they called it the Vasari feature set. So don't try to spend any time trying to get that out. But one of the big points that we want to talk about in terms of heterogeneity is, again, since we're coming from an imaging focused view of the world, you can have a piece of tissue that come that genetically is identical, but it can have significantly different outcomes. So you can imagine a small piece of tumor that is adjacent to the motor strip has a significantly, honestly, shorter outcome than one that was in the frontal lobe because when they actually go in and try to do the resection, you essentially, you know, you have to, you can't be as aggressive about it, otherwise you leave the patient paralyzed. So this is, again, other metadata and other ways of, of looking at this rich data set that's available. So, again, I'm actually not a neuroradiologist by training. I'm actually a psychiatrist, so I know you know, I can look at these things, we can identify things, and essentially what the radiolo neuroradiologists have done is come up with kind of validated ratings of, of different imaging properties. The ones I'm actually focusing on this talk are things that you, um, kind of descriptive of the tumor bulk. So one of the ones that's very kind of um, easy to wrap your hands around is the percentage of necrosis. So essentially what the, t what the radiologists do is kind of in their mind they have a mental image of a, how big the tumor is and then they can essentially segment, you know, they can say this tumor is highly necrotic and this tumor is basically has no signs of necrosis and they, they're trained to do this and these are some of the things that they happen to be good at and we had very good inter-rater and in, inter-rater reliability and we were doing these sorts of things. Now. Another, you know, there's, other, there's four or five features that I'm actually focusing on. And you can see here, actually, I went back. Um, basically, what happens is in order to actually standardize this across raters, they actually have a PDF um, feature guide that, you know, they go back and look at. And we spent a lot of time getting the vocabulary right so that people agreed what they were looking at. People agreed what the, ver what the, what the words meant so that we could actually get a standard set of ratings and 
and then we had people read the cases. So the necrosis one is one of the features. The other one that is going to wind up coming up a lot is the proportion of enhancing tumor. Essentially, what is very common and one of the key features, at least from the MRI data in, in GBMs, is contrast enhancement. What that means is you give gadolinium contrast agent IV, and then essentially parts that were not bright on the T1 image suddenly become bright. And that's particularly interesting kind of from a genetic genetic standpoint is it's associated with essentially a breakdown of the blood-brain barrier, microvascular hyperplasia, and essentially kind of funny-looking blood vessels. So you can imagine there, that would be uh, something that would be interesting to look at. So again, I don't want to spend too much time going into the tooling, but the actual process of acquiring this data was a, quite a monumental effort um, that was greatly aided by a number of our collaborators at the NCI. So basically, the neuroradiologists were given 10 or 20 cases. They downloaded them from the Cancer Imaging Archive. And then essentially, they have this kind of radiology workstation where there's a little plug-in, you know, the little Vasari plug-in, where essentially they go through all of the different imaging modalities. And many of you are probably not particularly familiar, familiar with kind of clinical neuroimaging, but, you know, they normally get five to ten different scans of the head, all with different types of imaging parameters, and the neuroradiologists are trained to use these, these different imaging modalities to look at different features. So essentially, they, you know, they, they download the images, they can look at them here, or they can, do some cross, they can do some very simple measurements, and then they basically go through and look for these different features, like the one I mentioned is eloquent cortex. You know, is it in an area that you really can't resect? And then you can imagine that would have uh, differential survival. So for, for the data that I'm about to present, uh, we had uh, markups that were, we had cases that were read by at least three neuroradi neuroradiologists for 72 patients. We now have about 125 patients that have been read, but this was all done not in time for this talk. And for the, for the ratings that are going to present, we have three ratings per person, but these are actually collapsed down to a single rating. And so the, basically, similar to, other, to these other analyses that have been presented, we're essentially using these imaging characteristics as a probe to get a better idea of kind of genetic and survival impl 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 implications of these sorts of things. So basically, the first kind of the, the easiest analysis we did is basically we looked to see if there's any sort of correlation between the present, you know, if you have more of this feature, what does it do to your survival? And so in this case, the feature that stood out the most is the more contrast enhancement you have, the shorter your survival was. And sort of as we build this argument that this imaging data can be useful, we also started doing some kind of multivariate regression where we took a, a standard clinical model, which usually has age, at least for GBM, the typical model has age, gender, and a, a performance scale, which is sort of how well the patient is doing at the time of surgery. And basically, we tried to see if adding additional information from the, from the imaging data would actually make you, basically give you a better model, give you better predictability. And this is basically what we're showing here is, in this case, is when we did um, stepwise linear, um, linear regression, Karnofsky's score was obviously highly significant, but basically when we started dichotomizing this and saying having a little bit of contrast enhancement versus a lot was, again, a significant predictor. Now, probably more, well, and then I have to um, oblige to show a, a, a a um, Kaplan-Meier survival curve, and again, this was this was significant. And this, one of the things that's nice about these kind of qualitative assessments is, well, I'll talk about kind of more sophisticated ways to do this, but these sort of clinical rules of thumb, be, you know, become very useful for a neuroradiologist to actually look at, and you know, kind of keep in their mind because they can do them relatively quickly. So. Unfortunately, I don't have to introduce this concept, but this idea of these molecular subtypes that are based on mRNA expression has been introduced multiple times. And one of the driving things that, as we started doing our more molecular analysis, is we basically asked, you know, if we have the proneural, the neural, the classical, and the mesenchymal subtypes, are there certain imaging, imaging derived features that are more common depending on, you know, your specific molecular genotype? And the answer is, at least in this analysis, the mesenchymal type was noted to have significantly lower rates of non-contrast enhancement compared to other tumors. Um, similarly, um, the proneural subtype, which, which is, can, has you know, there's a lot of interest in that specific subtype because of some survival differences, was noted to have a, large, a small degree of contrast enhancement. So essentially what this means is this is the area that essentially contrast enhances after gadolinium. And basically what happens is they kind of in their mind they say this is you know x units the entire tumor bulk in this case is basically this entire area of abnormality and again this is what neuroradiologists are trained to detect so these are the type of parameters that we're pulling out as to use as our probe now 
some of the other things, again, this is just really to touch and highlight on, on this concept, essentially, is we actually looked at some of the mutation data. Now, um, EGFR mutants, we discussed that uh, very recently. Um, it turns out of the 72 patients that we did these markups on, there was only, as of a couple months ago, the mutation status was available only on 50 of them, so it's, it's a slightly smaller subset. But basically, we wanted to see, you know, were, were there any imaging characteristics that defined um, patients who are likely to have EGFR mutations? And obviously, um, I'm showing it because there was, so basically EGFR patients had larger T had a larger tumor, essentially, or a larger t area of tumor abnormality. And interestingly, the TP53 mutants actually were smaller than the, than the wild types. And um, as a correlate, that means EGFR mutants were larger in general than the, e than the TP53 mutants. So just sort of t um, t to, conclude, to conclude my talk, the main point I really wanted to make in this is that imaging-based features can provide important prognostic information even after accounting for other clinical variables. And as we start doing these genetically defined um, you know, subclassifications and looking at things that predict survival, keeping in mind some of these other kind of obvious clinical factors like location of the tumor and how that affects surgery and treatment becomes important as we try to subtype these things. Um, current qualitative work suggests genotypes may be associated with these imaging phenotypes. And basically, this, this really sets the stage for future work. So as we said, we're increasing the sample size so we can, you know, going from 70 to 120 is obviously going to give us a lot more power. Also, we're actually starting to move from ordinal assessments where there's these sort of categories that are actually easy for the radiologist to, to assess to a continuous-based assessment because we think that's going to be a more sensitive pro, which you know, the field's called volumetrics. That's just more technically difficult, but this training data set that we have actually allows us to validate our algorithms and make sure we're actually doing what we're supposed to be doing. And kind of this is exactly parallels the, the work that um, Dr. Parvin and also Dr. Cooper and my group presented earlier with the pathology data. We can actually go in there and describe an even richer feature set that are things that are not easily to quantify for a neuroradiologist, but you can go in and describe texture, you can describe exact shape, and all sorts of these other kind of multiparametric multi properties of kind of what the tumor looks like. And we can start using, deriving additional probes to basically get a better idea of, you know, what is the... Having an, e having an EGFR V3 mutation, what is it, does it make your tumor look different? And, you know, going back and forth. Um, now, that should have worked. May I advance to the next slide? Okay, yeah, I'm about done. So, um, again, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm just about done my talk. I just want to give an acknowledgement. This is, you know, uh, huge number of people have actually been involved in this and what's what's nice about this community it's been very uh, ad hoc so there's been a number of people from Emory including uh, Lee Cooper and um, Chad Holder and Scott co collaborators from Thomas Jefferson Henry Ford SAIC Frederick John Fryman and Justin Kirby um, BU Carl Jaffe the NCI has been invaluable for statistical help UVA um, uh, Rivka Colon at Harvard and Northwestern and then finally I just sort of make a pitch um, if you're a TCG a contributing site and you happen to have radiology data we'd, we'd love to have it and if you can there's, we have ways to anonymize it and do a lot of the um, kind of grunt work to actually get your data out there and shared and we think having this additional resource will really inform a lot of the other work that we're doing and that's it thank you It's really exciting to see those uh, clinical correlates. Uh, thanks, David. I think we'll hold questions so we can have Elaine's talk at this point.